Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to the Kaveh 2020 virtual community and our seventh webinar in a series of special speakers made available to our Kaveh 2020 community. We are pleased that today's session open to all Kaveh members and community and partners. I'm Jan Kassusen Korea, Kaveh CEO. And while we really wish that we could have been together earlier this month in San Francisco for Kaveh 2020, it's very good to be together with you today virtually. I hope that during this time, you find yourself in a safe place, managing all the circumstances due to COVID-19 and ready to join together again with your Kabe Familia today and over the next few weeks via the Kabe 2020 virtual community website and webinars. So it's my pleasure to start us off today and introduce you and welcome uh, my wonderful colleague, Kabe's Manager of Administrative Systems and Membership, Joshua Haurigi. Joshua? Thank you, Jan. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, which is being presented by a dynamic duo in the field of bilingual education, Dr. Raymond Asola and Dr. Jim Cummins, co-authors of a new book, Transforming Sanchez School, Shared Leadership, Equity, and Evidence. Their presentation is sponsored today by the generous support of Castellan Publishing and Consulting, a platinum level sponsor of Cave 2020. As we get ready for today's exciting session, we have a few housekeeping matters to share. As this is a webinar, the speaker's microphones will be active and the participants will all be on mute. If you would like to pose a question during the presentation, please use the chat icon on the Zoom control menu at the bottom of your screen and the chat window will pop up where you'll be able to type in your questions or comments. For better focus, we will not be using the Q&A icon or window for today. After the webinar, we will be posting the recorded version of the Kabe 2020 virtual community website so you can re-listen and share it with others. Sit back, relax, and get ready for 45 minutes of powerful engagement and learning. To get us started, join me in welcoming Rebecca Field of Castellan Publishing and Consulting, who will introduce to you all Dr. Isola and Dr. Cummins, who will be presenting today on Transforming Sanchez School, Shared Leadership, Equity, and Evidence. Our thanks, and please welcome Rebecca. Hi, it's really nice to be here with you, Caslon Publishing in, here in Philadelphia. Um, and thank you, Kabe, for organizing these virtual community events. It's been so wonderful. We've been involved in about four of them so far. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Raymond Isola, who's the former principal of Sanchez School in the Mission District of um, San Francisco and Dr. Jim Cummins, who's an educational researcher, some of you might have heard of him, from um, Toronto. Um, I was just watching your smile, Jim. Um, these guys, Raymond and Jim, um, co-authored Transforming Sanchez School, as everyone has mentioned. And I just, it's a 16 year story of educational turnaround that Raymond was the principal of and worked throughout. Jim and Raymond, one of the things I love about this story is that Jim and Raymond, an educational researcher and a principal, collaborated throughout the, the 16 year period of what they were doing. They also, it's a story of commitment to, to students, to families, and to the communities. And what you're gonna see is how, how powerful it can be when educators work with families and community members to share responsibility for student learning, collaborate in innovative approaches to addressing local needs and use evidence from the research and from practice at Sanchez School to guide their work. And I hope there's lots of lessons for you in your own schools. Without further ado, thank you, Raymond and Jim. Great, thank you so much, Jan and the team from Cabe for your technical support and assistance and Rebecca for your kind introduction and uh, a big shout out for the Castlin team in supporting us to get this book to publication and, and out for use in the schools and in the universities. Um, this has been a, as you said, Rebecca, uh, a 15, 20 year collaboration with uh, Jim and I, and it's been a very dynamic relationship between theory and practice, practice feeding theory and theory feeding practice. And uh, we've really, I've grown a great deal and a lot of the foundation for my theoretical um, orientation towards uh, increasing the academic achievement of language minority students has come to my collaboration with Jim and 
deeply understanding that on a, on a deeper level. And um, there are three big areas that Jim and I have identified to support this successful turnaround at Sanchez School over the 13 years that I was principal. One is this idea, Rebecca, that you pointed to of evidence evidence-based learning and and that the second is this area of uh, the focus on teacher and principal agency and the use of agency and connection to agency with evidence-based uh, learning and school-wide practices. The third being shared leadership as well as the idea of developing a collaborative school culture of inquiry that is focused on increasing academic learning of students and monitoring academic learning, as well as the idea of closely monitoring student learning. At this time, I'll turn it over to uh, Jim to say a few words of introduction and then we'll go more deeply into the story about transforming Sanchez School. Thanks, Raymond. Um, let me first welcome everybody uh, to the webinar. Uh, I'm delighted to be here again. I gave a webinar, as some of you know, uh, last week, and this is a, uh, a follow-up uh, to that. Um, one of the things that uh, we think about, especially in these challenging times, is the challenges that educators and schools face in uh, helping students succeed academically. Uh, but I think we often tend to focus on the challenges without looking equally at the opportunities. And uh, what I'd love us to focus on uh, in this session is the inspirational pedagogy that's going on uh, in many school contexts across the United States, across North America and internationally. And Raymond and I are going to talk about one school uh, where the lives of students and their communities were transformed, but there are a lot of schools where this is happening. And I think at this point, we have a really clear idea of where we need to go to make that happen. So that's where we're aiming for in the presentation is to map out ways of getting to inspirational pedagogy. And the example that we'll talk about, uh, it gives uh, uh, one glimpse of what that uh, might look like in one particular school context. So welcome everybody, I'm delighted to be here and I'll hand it back to Raymond again. Thank you, Jim. So when I arrived at Sanchez School in 1999, I was very thrilled and excited to be part of uh, the, my third generation San Franciscan and coming back to San, Francis San Francisco to be part of a school community where bilingual education was being fostered and, and developed because when my parents went to school, that wasn't the case. So I was really excited to return to San Francisco after being a bilingual teacher and educator for, for 20 years. And uh, when I came to Sanchez School, I was quite stunned to see the condition that I found the school in. And um, that was due to the fact that in 1999, there was the first tech boom going on. And so it was a thriving city, a lot of uh, commerce and economics going on. But the condition that um, I found Sanchez School in was, was less than that. The physical plant was uh, not being well taken care of. There was low morale at the school. And, um, and there was a, a, a challenge in terms of uh, academic performance. So the performance was, this was the first year of no child left behind and the students were performing in the lowest quartile. I was hired by Superintendent Linda Davis to turn Sanchez School around. And um, what I had noticed when I came into the school that students were experiencing significant opportunity gaps to have eye access to high quality instruction from classroom teachers from preschool to fifth grade, because this was a preschool to fifth grade, serving approximately 300 students 60% of the students were English learners. 80% were on free and reduced lunch from low income backgrounds. And 25% had learning disabilities because there were four special day classes that the district had placed at Sanchez School. Also, there was a disconnect between the preschool program, 
that excluded families attending the K-5 program. It was a half day preschool in the morning and afternoon and for working class families that was problematic to be able to pick up or drop off their children in the middle of the day because they were working um, a, a full-time job and couldn't get the time off of work. The school climate was chaotic and reflecting low expectations. There were high ex unexcused absences, late arrivals, suspension. There was a high teacher turnover rate. These are very common in high poverty schools and students did not have access to a breakfast program. So essential needs that Jim talks about in a lot of his research, it's not only a linguistic need, but a social emotional need and nutrition being part of that as well. Health services were not available, primarily vision and dental services. And Linda Darling Hammond has done some research as a professor at Stanford, and she's the current um, member of, president of the State Board of Education. And she uh, did research to say that there were a cluster of schools throughout the nation that were in this uh, situation. By the late 1990s, there was a group of schools that had emerged that might be characterized as apartheid schools, serving exclusively students of color in low-income communities. And that was true for several schools in the Mission District, as well as Bayview, Hunters Point, this, this cluster of schools. And that's a neglected, abandoned school was the situation that I found the school in. As in any school community, there's also assets within the school, and I want to point to what some of those assets are. There were parents who were wanting their children as to be, they wanted to be co-educators and they understood the opportunities that schools, schooling represents for their children as an opportunity for them to, many of them wanted their children to attend the best universities in the United States and to have professional jobs. And so they saw this early, early, beginnings of their education as quite essential and important. The students came to school very creative and talented with a strong drive to make a difference in their families' lives as well as in the school community. And there were pockets of staff deeply committed to making a difference in students' lives. In the Mission District, there's many community-based organizations like Columbia Park Boys and Girls Club, Mission Cultural Center, the Randall Museum, and the Mission Science Center. So there were very important community resources and funds of knowledge that could be tapped into. And then Linda Davis and her team, there was a strong commitment and support for school reform to be able to make educational opportunities available for all students. At this time, Jim's going to lay out some of what the evidence based instructional responses are and some potential sources of uh, disadvantage are for linguistically diverse students. Okay, thanks Raymond. I'll try and just sum up in a, in a very uh, concise way what uh, some of the data is, is showing about what are the potential sources of underachievement among uh, students and what we know we can do in schools to help turn that around. It's kind of interesting to think about but um, we haven't really approached this in a logical way in, the, uh, in discussions about educational achievement. Uh, we've tended to focus on our particular concern. If we're looking at uh, emerging bilingual students, we look at the linguistic issues that students need to um, uh, address when they're coming from a home background that's different from the language of the school. And a lot of the English as an additional language uh, provision uh, will focus in on scaffolding and uh, how do we get students to understand the language of instruction. But there's more than just linguistic issues involved in underachievement. We know also that students from socially disadvantaged backgrounds, students from low income backgrounds also tend to experience disproportionate underachievement. There are a variety of factors associated with that, uh, including inadequate health care, inadequate nutrition, housing segregation. If we have uh, housing segregation, which we do both in the United States and many other countries, uh, then we have school segregation. Uh, there's often uh, among students coming from poverty backgrounds, a lack of cultural and material resources in the home due to poverty. Parents don't have money to buy books, to buy iPads, to buy cell phones that uh, a lot of kids from middle class backgrounds take for granted. And there's often limited access to print in home and school, again, as a result of, of poverty in the schools. Um, but th in addition to 
the challenges of learning through a language that uh, students initially don't understand, the challenges of coming from a, a low uh, income background where poverty is characteristic of the lives of, of families. There's also the legacy of uh, uh, decades and, and centuries of discrimination and racism of various kinds. So uh, uh, a lot of students are coming from marginalized status backgrounds uh, where their communities have experienced societal discrimination, where there be, there's been a history of low teacher expectations, where stereotypes in relation to uh, characteristics of students and communities are common in the community, where the varieties of both the first language and second language uh, uh, varieties, uh, languages that students speak are often stigmatized. And broadly speaking, there's a pattern of identity devaluation that students and communities experience. So we've got to put these three factors together when we look at what we need to do. And there are um, evidence-based instructional responses that correspond to each of these um, characteristics. And the reality is that the students who are underachieving predominantly come from linguistic backgrounds characterized by all three of these, uh, these factors. They're learning um, the school language, they're coming from low-income backgrounds, and uh, they're coming from communities that have been socially marginalized through racism and various other forms of discrimination in the broader community. So we need to respond to all of these. It's not just linguistic factor. What we know in terms of effective responses is that educators and administrators and teachers need to know how to scaffold comprehension and, and production of language across the curriculum uh, to make it comprehensible for, uh, for students. Uh, we know there's a huge amount of uh, research that has escalated during the past 20 years about the positive impact of recognizing and acknowledging students' multilingualism and their home language uh, proficiencies and engaging those languages within the school uh, uh, in community and instruction. And then we need to reinforce academic language right across the curriculum. Um, uh, those that can be looked at seen as windows through which we can look at, at part of the change process in schools. But when we look at what we can do to turn around the effects of uh, low socioeconomic status, there's not much we can do about things like housing segregation. That's there. Um, as educators, our instruction can't really address that directly. But one of the things that we can do a lot about uh, is uh, respond to the fact that many of the students coming into our schools from poverty backgrounds have not had extensive access to print, uh, either in home and sometimes outside of um, the home in terms of uh, local libraries. And uh, research also suggests that some schools serving students from low income backgrounds do not have strong library resources, et cetera. And there's a huge amount of research out there suggesting that one of the major factors determining how well students will learn how to read and to write is the extent to which uh, they become actively engaged with literacy. Uh, so we need to maximize ac the access that students have to print and uh, ensure that they get engaged with literacy from the earliest stages. And this applies to the preschool uh, environment just as much as to the primary years and beyond. Uh, and again, we need to reinforce academic language right across the curriculum. When we look at what we can do to address issues related to the marginalized status of many students, uh, we need to recognize and affirm the experiences that students are bringing to school. We need to connect instruction to students' lives. We need to decolonize the curriculum and, and instruction through culturally sustaining pedagogy. That's a term that many of you may be uh, familiar with, uh, but basically it involves challenging the devaluation of uh, students' experiences and community experiences within our pedagogy. We need to valorize and build on the languages and the varieties of languages as that students bring to school. And broadly speaking, in response to a, a, a pervasive pattern of identity devaluation in the wider society, as educators, we need to affirm students' identities in association with academic engagement. There's all of these uh, responses are supported by a wide range of research. And I think you'll see as Raymond talks about the um, initiatives that he and his colleagues at Sanchez took, that these uh, responses are woven throughout a lot of the things that they, they did over a period of 13 years. Get back to you, Raymond. Thank you, Jim. So building this school turnaround momentum 
First, there was the need to develop a, a conducive learning environment. As I mentioned before, there was a chaotic environment. This was based on community involvement, shared leadership of developing a, a plan based on respect, responsibility, honesty, and cooperation. It was a pro proactive type of approach to building a, a sense of uh, social development and skill development that also supported creating a conducive environment for, for learning. We also uh, acquired a grant from the California Department of Education to hire a bilingual social worker to meet students' social and emotional needs. Um, I was speaking to Chancellor Carranza a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about that, particularly during this time of the COVID-19 trauma, a lot of families going through that and this idea of addressing students' social emotional needs. To recruit teachers with a focus on instructional effectiveness and social justice and collaboration that students really um, identify with, with teachers that understand the students' background and life experiences and can connect with them and to be also wanting to collaborate and not work in isolation. And to create a school culture of collaborative inquiry with support from San Francisco Community School and the Bay Area School Reform Collaborative. This is really important that a school like Sanchez or other schools do not work in isolation, but they work with another school community so that we can learn from one another as a school community when we move forward for this type of creating a school culture of collaborative inquiry where we're growing and learning and professional development is embedded in the daily life of the school for the teachers and for the principal and everybody associated with the school. And to cultivate a culture of authentic learning where the staff and parents are growing alongside the, the students. And to, as we engaged in this process with the Bay Area School Reform Collaborative, there was a coach that supported us with it. There was a growing faculty understanding of participating in the results-oriented cycle of inquiry process to improve instruction and to assess student learning. So this was an ongoing monitoring. And what we, the area we focused on was the idea of the collaborative inquiry process was on academic language development across the curriculum as Jim had talked about. We had assessed students home language in Spanish and many of the students were coming to school with delayed um, academic achievement in uh, development in their in their home language in Spanish as well as in English so we were across the instructional strands of the English language development strand the special education strand and the bilingual maintenance strand there was a focus on language development and the importance of and that's effect on reading comprehension the school-wide academic focus was on writing across the curriculum, guided reading so that the students were having opportunities to read at their independent level as well as at their instructional level. And then there was a strong emphasis on pro professional development using what is called tribes. Tribes is a bilingual program that is classroom based to teach shared v values and community norms so that teachers in the classroom had the capacity of also to address students' social and emotional needs and to create an environment conducive to learning within the classroom. Another aspect to this is that we um, applied and acquired a grant to, uh, from the San Francisco Art Commission to have a three-year demonstration grant of the arts in the schools. The arts have a tremendous potential, and Jim and I write about this in the book for academic development, co cognitive development, and many schools like Sanchez, the arts were eliminated to try and improve standardized test scores, and we did the exact opposite. We engaged the arts and infused the visual and performing arts throughout the curriculum to make the, um, the, the curriculum come alive to the students and they engaged in it and also created higher order thinking skills as well as uh, deeper language development across the curriculum. Do you want to respond to that at all, Jim? No, I think if you just go on, that's, uh, that's fine. There's, as you said, there's, uh, 
there's a lot of research suggesting that the arts are basic. Thank you. Then uh, in 2005, there was a, um, a really misguided dream school initiative that was blaming a lot of schools in San Francisco. That was with Superintendent Ackerman, who really believed in wanting to improve academic achievement for, for all students in Bayview Hunters Point, which were primarily African American and, and Latinx students, and then the Mission District. But it, Sanchez School was on a positive tra trajectory, and um, we were selected to become a dream school, and 90% 90, 90 of the staff was reconstituted. So in 2005, what we've identified was there's a, a second turnaround plan. And sometimes uh, when there's evidence-free approaches to this, that Jim and I talk about, and it comes from the, the school district or from the state or from the national government, there are effects on the school side. And this was had a tremendous effect at, at Sanchez School. And so in 2005, we had 90% new faculty and um, quickly we began a home visit project through the Zellerbach Foundation to build relationship between families and the new faculty at Sanchez School and to re rebuild the collaborative inquiry culture using the results-oriented cycle of inquiry process. And this was done through a collaboration with partners in school innovation, um, focusing on language arts development across the curriculum. Once again, focusing and infusing the arts across the curriculum and using school-wide tribes to, to be able to coordinate and to address students social emotional needs. And as Jim mentioned, really building blocks for fostering a positive school climate with school-wide coordination. New dimensions to the school turnaround between 2005 and 2012. And, and this is something where the influence from Kabe is very important because we actually went to a intensive institute, a pre-conference pre in institute that was held in San Jose with guided language ac acquisition design, GLAD. And we went, parents, teachers, and I attended a pre-institute conference and we decided to incorporate GLAD across the uh, entire school and using it to teach uh, subject areas and to stimulate language development and higher order thinking skills. So this was a really interesting collaboration, how Kabe influenced a school by having these pre-conference institutes. And we in, it participated in that and came back and shared it with our school site council to be able to um, engage in this process. Another aspect of this is the idea, and Jim and I write about this in the book, is the principal being a community organizer and organizing with resources from the community to bring into the school and to also be a social architect of learning and being able to create a learning environment for adults as well as the students. We also spent a significant amount of time uh, restructuring the preschool. So it was a full day preschool, it wasn't a half day. And then we saw a much larger percentage of Sanchez students actually going from the preschool program into the K-5 program. And we actually hired the first school in San Francisco Unified School District to hire a certificated bilingual teacher in the preschool program. So there was an alignment between the preschool all the way up through the, through the kindergarten and fifth grade bilingual maintenance strand of the school. We did significant uh, improvements to the school grounds and revitalization through a collaboration with San Francisco Slow Food and viewing the school campus as an educational resource for nutritional development and um, physical development at the school, physical fitness. And a greater emphasis on parent leadership development as well with collaboration from San Francisco Organizing Project and the PICO Project with this interfaith statewide uh, organization to, su to support community development and leadership. And then a collaboration with reading partners. We had uh, the first school in San Francisco to have reading partners where individuals would come, on, come in and read one-on-one -on -one with the students for a half hour each day. 
and then the San Francisco Marin Food Bank. So once again, it's this comprehensive approach to looking at the students' multifaceted needs and being able to address that with an under-resourced school. It takes the school leadership to be able to be a community organizer and community activist and a social architect of learning. This is a template that Jim actually used at Sanchez School with the faculty and it was quite useful for us to understand where we were going and Jim's gonna address this. Okay, um, thanks Raymond. This is a, a fairly generic uh, template that uh, can be adapted and adjusted uh, according to uh, the realities of uh, individual schools. But basically it says, like, where are we now in relation to different kinds of instructional options or choices that we have? Uh, for example, to what extent are we uh, maximizing students' engagement with literacy? Uh, to what extent are we scaffolding uh, content to link with students' existing knowledge, etc.? And you can include a variety of different uh, dimensions of the school curriculum and instruction in there. You can take out things that aren't uh, relevant. But if we look at something like language and culture, to what extent are students getting the message that their home language is a resource, that it makes them smarter, which is what the research is saying, uh, or is there an implicit culture in the school that you leave your home language at the schoolhouse door? And unfortunately, that is the case in a lot of schools. Um, so you can look at, at a variety of dimensions of the, uh, the school culture, the school instruction, ask where are we now collectively, this is for all teachers in the school to ask, uh, both individually and in, in groups of discussion focused on school achievement, of school improvement. Um, what's our vision for the future? What's, what's our uh, collective identity as educators? Where do we want to be? What kind of pedagogy do, do we want to implement? Uh, if we could choose, and then how do we move in that direction? So it's, as I said, this is just one option that uh, is very genetic, but can be adapted to uh, the planning process in, uh, in any school context. And one of the things that comes out of research very clearly is that when there's a whole school planning process, it works much better than when uh, individual teachers are doing their own school and there's no real coordination. Uh, okay, back to you, Raymond. Okay. Thank you, Jim. This was very useful for us at Sanchez School, and I remember we were really particularly interested when Lori Olson did her research on long-term uh, English learners, and we were really looking at how students were acquiring both Spanish and English in the bilingual strand at Sanchez School. So it was very useful to have Jim come and, and use this template with us. Over the um, 13 years, there were some very tangible outcomes that came of it. As I mentioned to you, the fall 1999, when I arrived at the school, the academic performance index, which was used at the time, was 499. And in spring 2012, the uh, academic performance index increased to 761 points, which averaged approximately 20 points per year where the average elementary school in California grew 11 points. So there was some tangible academic achievement which measures language arts, science, and mathematics. The average daily attendance improved over the 13 years that I was principal at the school and Kamala Harris, who was the district attorney at the time came to Sanchez School. We were trying to lower uh, the d amount of students that had truancies and from the school. And so she came to see what we were doing to create a positive learning environment. So there was, we saw a significant decrease in unexcused absences, school suspensions. And then in talking to uh, Chancellor Cadanza, he was talking about the idea of creating a, a upward mobility for staff members, um, Chancellor at N New York Public Schools and this idea of that creating a positive culture for, for learning and th this being an indicator. So three paraprofessionals from Sanchez School earned their teaching credential and actually moved into classroom teaching positions. So just identifying this potential and, and creating a, a learning environment for adults as well as children, parents as co-educators, this idea of staff members, both paraprofessionals and certificated teachers, and then also the administration growing and learning side by side. It really creates a, a, a positive synergy within a school community. 
and then teachers moving into greater leadership positions, uh, head of the librarian for the district, instructional reform facilitators, teacher coaches, etc. Seven teachers have moved into those types of positions, and then eight classroom teachers have actually moved into school principalships in San Francisco Unified School District, and a high level of teacher and paraprofessional retention. So a high, high amount of stability, the families wanting this type of connection with their school community, knowing that their children are in a safe, caring place of high expectations and that their children are growing and learning. So this created a, a positive environment for, for staff, students, and, and parents at the school. At this time, I'll turn it over to uh, Jan and we'll see if there's some questions from the uh, audience. Thanks so much, Raymond and Jim. What a fascinating start to your presentation. There has been quite a bit of um, discussion on our, in our chat window. So I'm gonna bring a few of them to the front. Um, the first couple of the ones that came forward came from um, friends that we know, Michael Gensick and Verena Garcia Ramos. And it's really around um, the collaboration of families and community in the, in the school. How, you know, how, um, if, you could, if you could elaborate, excuse me, if you could elaborate more on the collaboration with families and community. And then Verena asked, I think really intrigued with the idea of the home visits. And how did you get your teachers to really buy into home visits and in building that family and community collaboration? It's so powerful, she notes, but it's challenging to make it mandatory or happen. So could you talk a little bit more about that collaboration of families and community and connecting the school to that? Sure. Yeah, I, 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 I think that was a very part of powerful intervention. And when I was doing my undergraduate, Jan, there was uh, this idea of going out and doing home visits. So you become a learner and you understand what the students' lives are. It's like Jim was talking about connecting to students' lives when you're reading or writing and understanding where they come from before who they are and who their families are and where they live before they come to the school and this was particularly important for us when 90 percent we went through this um, reconstitution in 2005 becoming a dream school we lost 90 percent of a very skilled faculty that we had built this momentum for phase number one and we were working with community organizers from the San Francisco Organizing Project. And they actually came in and said they had a $20,000 grant from the Zellerbach Foundation, and they were going to do professional development. So there was a very um, organized way of doing home visits. And the teachers were paid additional hours to be able to go out, because this had to take place after school. And you would do it in pairs. So we would do that in pairs, and, but it would be the idea of building a relationship with the families. And it was very, in talking to the teachers and to the f parents about this, it really deepened the relationships and an understanding and the trust and the communication. And also seeing some of the funds of knowledge that were in the community. There was, uh, I remember one father when I did a home visit was a, a great uh, dancer. And uh, so he would come in and teach dance to the students at the school. There was another parent that was a, a soccer player and playing soccer with the students coming in. Another mother that was a, a wonderful cook. And so she did cooking with the students. And so there were different funds of knowledge and building this type of relationship with the families. And that took place over a two year period of time. Well, that leads us into another really interesting question. Christine just asked, did you find because of that, what you were finding and building that sense of community and connection between the home school and community connection, did you find that enrollment increase as a direct result of your team's incredible collaboration of transforming Sanchez School? Yes, we saw a, a slow and steady increase in enrollment. We also, that was another strategy of involving the visual and performing arts because a lot of the families saw the value of the visual and performing arts. And so they really understood that we, we, set, we developed the infrastructure within the school where we had a visual arts studio, a, a music studio, 
a dance studio. And so we really had the space within the school to really set it up to be a demonstration school. And parents responded to that as well because they wanted their children and they saw their children benefiting and being motivated by the, engaging in the visual and performing arts. So it was, a, it was how we positioned ourselves in, in the world, but it also takes a principal once again to be a community organizer and activist. Because sometimes you go out into the community and you understand that there are challenges in the community and maybe there are unsafe situations. So you come back and we had a good relationship with the Mission District Police Department and the Fire Department and being able to deal with issues of, of safety in the community and uh, when there was a park two blocks away from the school and the renovation of the park that the the leadership of the school needs to also understand what's going on in the community and not in a theoretical sense, but actually getting out into the community and engaging in the community directly with her or his staff members. So I would go on, but you'd always do home visits in pairs and then you would have a time to be able to debrief that as well, Jan. That's great, thank you. So, you know, Raymond, we have a question. I'm gonna kind of combine questions from Margaret and Kelly and Peter. Um, okay. So there's a little bit of curiosity on the, in the chat box about the reconstitution of 90% of the faculty. And I know you referenced that a little bit, but um, there's some desire to hear a little bit more about how and why that happened. And then Peter's question kind of, I maybe build into that, maybe not, but it's about the area of teacher recruitment. And that it seems like back at, you know, in the time when you were working at Santos, the idea of getting quality and fully prepared teachers for English learners was, was challenging. And it still remains an issue in our schools. So how did that happen and how did you really work with that, that teacher recruitment um, capacity building? I, I think that's a really important part of the turnaround story. And I would always involve uh, parents and teachers if it was a grade level, first grade, um, that there was an opening, for example, we would involve teachers at that first grade and they would be able to talk about the collaboration that was going on through the inquiry process and that teachers had release time to be able to participate in that. And um, we described this in the book about the, um, the reconstitution because even people from the district office later on had, had talked saying that we were on a positive trajectory of improvement. We had the academic achievement results to be able to show that, but because we weren't at a, a certain level that um, the superintendent at the time thought that reconstituting the, and having everybody reapply for their jobs would be a way to deal deal with that, to improve academic achievement results. And there was a tremendous backlash from the, families at the school because they really respected and saw that their uh, children were benefiting by the quality of the faculty that we had. And so it wasn't only the academic achievement results that we're getting in standardized test scores, but the, there was a high level of satisfaction from the families at the school that their children were in, at a safe school, that they had high expectations and that they were growing and learning and were glad to go to the school. So this was a strong backlash from, from the families at the school as well. So it was a very traumatic experience for the Sanchez school community to be able to uh, rebuild after that. And, and to be honest, there was a high degree of suspicion because the, the parents did not trust the district office at the time about that type of, um, the teachers chose not to reapply for their jobs because they felt like it had been disrespectful to them and it was a choice that the teachers had to make because they, we had the academic achievement results. We had the parents who were collaborating with us. And so they saw this as a, a possibility. Uh, this was very disrespectful to the hard work that, that we had done as a, as a school community. Well, thank you for that. Boy, we could be on this for two hours with all the questions that are coming up. So we're gonna have to find a way to maybe do some written responses and post them online. I think we might have time for one more. And, um, and I'm sorry for our audience, there's just such rich questions and we will be committed to working with Raymond and Jim to write up the responses and to post them on the website. Give us a couple of days or so to do so, but um, just really rich questions. Um, I think the last question I wanna bring forth is one from Aaron. And I think it's so important because that's a situation that we're still you know, dealing with now. And how was it that you worked with your paraprofessionals and building and growing them into teaching positions? 
because we see that that is such a key strategy now as well that's needed for building our bilingual teacher workforce. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I, I think it was really a, a, a very authentic uh, way of valuing them when we would have professional development opportunities to include them in those opportunities. For example, the preschool teachers, uh, when we would go to a certain professional development workshop um, or go and visit at another school that we would always include the paraprofessionals in that because there's a classroom teacher with two paraprofessionals in the preschool program. You have to have a, a one, one adult to eight children ratio in the preschool program. So they really felt valued and then they got excited about, about becoming a part of it. So it's a way of authentically valuing the role that they have and for giving them opportunities to see that, they're, um, that they could grow and learn and that they have the capabilities to, um, to contribute at a larger, uh, on a larger level if they choose to. And so there was one particular uh, preschool paraprofessional who um, became, uh, got her credential, her bilingual credential, and uh, is bilingual, bicultural, and now is, uh, you know, contributing at, at a higher level. So that it's that kind of, really kind of those nonverbal messages about how you include people and you really value them as, as members of a, of a school community. But I thought it was really interesting that Chancellor Caranzo really kind of looks at that within a, a school or a district to see how people are, you're, you're kind of cultivating the human capital within an organization and you don't always have to recruit from outside. For example, um, to move to San Francisco, to fairly difficult to find housing and affordable housing. So if you could recruit from within, that's something that's being done currently by Dr. Matthews. He's trying to recruit principals from within the district that teachers that are want to grow in, into these types of positions. And so there's cultivating from within, I think has a lot of uh, benefits. Fabulous, thank you so much. Well, I'm sorry to say this, we have reached the end of our time um, and I will turn it back over to Joshua to bring us to a closing. Joshua? Well, um, thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you, Dr. Isola and Dr. Cummins. It was an inspiring, timely, and really significant presentation. Um, this has been a powerful addition to our Kabe 2020 virtual community webinar series. All the participants can access the video archive and handouts at kabe2020.org. No username or password is needed. It's open for all. To access and purchase Raymond and Jim's book, please email Marisol Lescano at mlescano at caslaninc.com. We're excited to share that tomorrow, April 30th, we will be welcoming Dr. Alma Florada and Isabel Campoy for a joint webinar at 2 p.m. They are sponsored by Velasquez Press as a continuation of our Kabe 2020 virtual community webinar series. Again, thank you to Raymond, Jim, and Caslon, And thank you to you all participants for joining the Kabe 2020 virtual community. On behalf of the Kabe Board of Directors and the whole Kabe team, we hope you have felt the Kabe connection, inspiration, and love, just as if we were together physically at Kabe 2020 conference. Please stay safe, be well, and know that we're all in this together. We are all Kabe strong. Thank you and hasta la próxima. <laughs>